Hey guys, this is Kevin Smith Jr., your host for the Container Happy Hour. Grab a drink, join us every two weeks, and we'll talk containers and future of the market. Ladies and gentlemen, the operations director of Tech Stainer, Mr. Brad Bostorf. How are you, buddy? Doing good. Good to see you uh, remotely in this wacky world we're living in. No kidding, man. No kidding. So uh, you've selected IPA for us today. I, I went and got one of these. <laughs> uh, Stonewall Inn IPA. So cheers to you. Cheers. Uh, so tell us, uh, tell us what makes an IPA an IPA, just for starters. Why was that the selection? Okay, so IPA stands for uh, India Pale Ale, and really, without going too long into history, uh, back in the day, when you take barrels across the Indian Ocean, they put hops in it, and actually it's, a, it's an antiseptic, so we keep it from spoiling, basically, in the hot weather. So when they got there, uh, it would stabilize, and long story short, kind of uh, the American beer revolution going back maybe about 20 years now. Um, they started to use hops for flavoring more and more and more and assertive bitterness. And that's really right now with an IPA as you associate with bitter, uh, it has to have a certain bittering unit. And now because of the beer industry, we, we've, we've developed hybrid hops. So now you have generations of these new hops. So every year there's new hops and, and kind of the, the theme now and similar to what I brew is you can get juicy fruity uh elements from these hops and and now it's a it's a big crossbreeding thing in the industry so we're seeing this development over time is is ipas have become probably the biggest selling uh component of a craft beer just because of the variety you can get now so in the first two minutes you've already solidified why you're the perfect guest for this show <laughs> well <laughs> you can see by the setup behind me, uh, I'm quite into brewing and have been for a long time. So how to, talk about that for a minute. Uh, that's This is in your house, right? This is your basement? Yeah, this is my basement. If, if I could show you above, I actually, I, I call myself Poor Judgment Brewing, P-O-U-R. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the only reason I bought the house was when we moved in, my wife told me I could set up my brewery down here and I could stand <laughs> on the ceiling. So, um I started really quickly. I started um, as a uh, got into craft beers kind of when it first came onto the scene, just trying stuff. I'd go to the store and I'd try something different every time. Uh, and then I had a very close friend in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and he actually won a contest with Breckenridge Brewing that they brewed his style of home beer commercially. And they were releasing it at the Great American Beer Festival in Denver. So I get a call and he goes, come out here. And I go out there and I said, walk me through, you know, brewing. And when I saw him do it, I'm like, this is easy. I can do this. <laughs> and so uh, I came home and convinced my wife to start buying some equipment. And, and kind of after that experience and seeing everything, just kind of started experimenting and just kept consistent, kind of enjoyed it, dabbled in competitions, you know, placed in some competitions. And now it's basically become uh i've gotten more husbands in my neighborhood involved there's a lot of women who hate me in my town uh, <laughs> but there are husbands it, we'll come full circle now i have so many people brewing that i get free beer handed to me all the time now so it's it's actually it's finally paid off if you will so <laughs> it's it's awesome now how many different types of beer do you make personally these days, uh, I stick to IPAs. Predominant. That's what I like to drink if I have a beer. I, I'm, I'm a hop head. Uh, I just enjoy the IPA, so I experiment with a lot of hops. Uh, I do bourbon barrel aged stouts. I like a very dark, heavy stout beer in the winter, aged with you know coffee, vanilla beans, whiskey. Um, I'll do some porters, do some wheat beers. Um, I've pretty much brewed everything over the years. I just don't go into some of these other beers I don't drink anymore. I just, it's not worth my time. It used to be cool to have a bunch of beers on tap and then nobody drinks them. 
<laughs> so yeah, exactly. It's kind of like, what am I wasting my time for? And now with the uh, children in life, it's it's uh, it's an early weekend hobby. You know, get it done early in the morning, and uh, you know, be able to enjoy it for a while. So mainly, it's just it's the stuff you're going to want to drink yourself if all else fails. And uh, how much of a time commitment is that to to make your own beer? Um. So the, the, the full process, there's two methods. There's one's an extract method, that which is a little bit quicker. They've kind of extracted the, the grain for you already. Uh, and then there's all grain brewing. So all grain brewing will take you about start to finish roughly three hours. That's including cleanup. Uh, extract, maybe about an hour and a half, uh, much quicker because you don't have to wait for all the grain and all this stuff. So both you can yield a good beer, you know, traditionally, all grain is the way to go. But uh, with the extracts, you can actually make a very good beer, especially when you're going really hoppy or you're making a dark beer. You can achieve similar results. This is awesome, man. This is already better. Like, I don't want to switch to the industry talk. I just well, want to keep talking about beer. Well, don't make me start talking about yeast and cultivating and all that stuff. So I do uh, I do actually grow some of my own hops in the summer. Uh, then I'll use it in beer in September. Um, and you know what, it, it became a hobby so big right now, especially under these circumstances, sure. um, even more people have discovered it, but when you start seeing other people take an interest in the hobby, it's kind of funny. And, and I think some of that spurred by the growth of the microbrew in America to the today. Right. So. Right. And that's a big, uh, a big transition. You know, people don't just go to the store and pick up Bud Light, Coors Light, Miller Light anymore. Right. They're, they're really looking for a flavor or something they can relate to. And they they seem to take a lot of pride in the local brews. Right. I noticed that more so too, like regional local preferences. Yeah, you're right. And I think, uh, you know, regions have developed out of the beer scene. You know, IPA is really got to push from California and they still have a West Coast IPA, very piney, good, bitter backbone, a little bit more malt. Whereas New England completely changed the IPA game, you know, about 10 years ago and everything soft, uh, very fruity hops, very low bitterness, but much higher alcohol volume. So you'll be drinking a 10% beer, but it'll taste just like a normal 5% beer. So there's a, a couple different concepts going on. And now they add lactose and fruit and you have so many combinations now. It's, it, every year there seems to be a different take on an IPA. Sours sure. have to be the thing this year. Yeah, I've seen that quite a bit. So where does where does this go? Like, does this end as a hobby or do one day we see some mountain biking lodge brewery thing for poor judgment? Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I my wife always tells me you anything you're talented at, you don't get paid for. So uh, <laughs> I don't I'm not really sure. <laughs> Where this goes, I can't tell you uh, for many years now, I've always been approached by people like, hey, uh, I'm an investor. You want to start a brewery? They try your beer and stuff. So there's always options like that. The reality is yeah, at this point in life, um, I'd love to do something in some fashion to help out. But the reality is, as I'm established in a career, uh, there was probably a time if I had the foresight um, to, to do that. But you're also seeing the industry so crowded now and it's popping up everywhere. I mean, everywhere is a, 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 you can go somewhere, you can get goodies, you can hang out outside, kid yep. friendly, bring a pet. Um, and it's really changed, especially out where I live downtown, it's brought a lot of business in with some, uh, with, with some small microbreweries. So, um, no, I'll keep, I'll probably just keep home brewing and mountain biking and doing my own thing and enjoying <laughs> it. But, but I've got more friends to experience it with now locally. So that's good. Yeah. Well, if it ever becomes a destination, I mean, I went on the guest list, so I want to, uh, <laughs> I want to make the trip. Well, but I will, I will say there's been a few people from the industry who've come to some of Brad's beer parties. We, we've, we've had some parties in the past. So, uh, some former colleagues, yes, they've been to my house. So, well, let's, let's transition a little bit to the, to the industry and, and colleagues and all that kind of stuff. So, Give us a little summary about how you even got started in the container world and, and how that kind of evolved for you. Okay. Um, easy story. I graduated college. I was literally moving mulch in my parents' backyard. 
And we had a, a friend of the family who ran a, a temporary employment agency. And I guess somebody had canceled and she called me and just said, listen, I, I know this isn't what Brad's looking for, but can he go on an interview just to, so I don't look like an idiot, basically. Um, and it happened to be with Triton Containers, um, of which I had no idea about anything. And I walked in there, you know, 22, fresh out of college. And, uh, and I actually interviewed with a great guy, Lou Testa. Um, and they called me back the next day and, and said I was hired. So <laughs> I showed up uh, the next day uh, early. Nobody was there. The door was locked. And uh, it was a great experience. Um, you know, it was really my first job besides, you know, I worked at a, a chocolate, a homemade chocolate store throughout high school and college. So that's a whole nother right. story. Uh, but that, that was about three and a half, almost four years where I learned the industry from a customer service level. Uh, one of the, the neat things that happened to me was, you know, as a customer service person at that time, you didn't travel. Um, it was, you know, the marketing people kind of had this way the business ran on the leasing side. And the guy I was working for was adamant to get me exposure to the West Coast. So I ended up doing two-week visits from, you know, Oakland, L.A., Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, uh, at a really young age of meeting people in the industry um, before I really knew what I was doing at all. Um, and it was kind of eye-opening. I didn't know anything about it, but it was interesting. Um, and from that, I kind of transitioned into uh, getting a job offer um, with uh, Swire Shipping for a couple years. I learned a little bit of the shipping side. And through that, I developed all these connections with the leasing companies. Um, so you're doing lunches with you know people like Lisa, um, who's always been my guardian angel in this this industry, and it was like the greatest <laughs> thing meeting her uh, was we hit it off, and it happened that um, Swire went to break bulk, so they they let me go after a couple of years. They weren't going to do containers, and it just so happened that uh, Mark and Rich, the guys over at Florence I worked with, were having this industry night that they did, and I had already been invited. Sure enough, you, you go to this, you know, people, they had looked to hire somebody that they were going to train on a technical side. So I had never really taken interest in, in doing something until that, that opportunity sounded interesting to me. I'd worked with these guys in m &R. I thought it was an interesting niche. I wasn't really interested in resales or marketing. It just wasn't my thing. So I said, hey, I'd be interested. Um, they made the offer. Um, you know, next thing I know, I'm with Lauren's learning for eight years. Uh, I learned everything I know really over there. I have a lot of credit to those guys. Um, and it kind of helped me grow. And the next thing I knew is there was an opportunity to grow beyond that, um, and actually join Textainer. Uh, and when I got over there, it was just a perfect door in, uh, it was a time of some change going on. Uh, I came in and it kind of propelled me and then. Now I'm actually working with some former colleagues at those old companies have come over to work with me. So it's kind of this full circle. We all kind of uh, end up working with somebody we used to know at some point. So uh, now here I am, uh, uh, happy to be uh, with Tex Tanner. And it's, it's just been a great experience ever since I've been here. And I, and I just finished five years not too long ago. Uh, so it's been a little while here, you know, it's, uh, it's been great. Yeah, that's that's a great uh, a great summary of all of it, and and I knew some of that, but I appreciate you taking it all the way back to the beginning. That's really good stuff, um, and and obviously, big shout out to the the Florence people that you mentioned, like Lisa and Mark and Rich. I mean, that's some of the best people you could ever spend time with when you're learning this industry. So glad, uh, I'm I'm sure you're grateful for those times with those with those people. Yeah, um, I actually uh, talked to Mark yesterday, so I <laughs> keep in touch with him as well. For for those listening, that's our uh, our CEO of the NBSL, Mr. Mark D. Pasquale. So he's uh, he's a good one to have that you're catching up with. Um, when you when you look through that time, right when you transitioned from from Triton and Swire and and Florence and Textainer, what are some of the big changes you've seen in criteria and m and and just general care and changes to the lease fleet for someone in your role? Because you've, you've seen it now from inception to this 
overview, kind of where you are now, right? Yeah. So from an M and R standpoint, I think a lot's changed because uh, I think it's one of the hardest things. You know, people uh, when you when you talk about an estimate and, and components, especially when you get into specialty equipment like flat racks and stuff, there's so much. And, and, you know, you have to pass exams and everything. And I, when I first took an IICL exam, I mean, it was the worst thing I've ever done. I mean, these <laughs> questions, it, it, they basically took all the guys who knew everything for so many years and just came up with the most ridiculous, hardest questions. Instead of asking somebody, how do you actually measure something? Um, that, that has changed. So, <laughs> What's happened over the years is I think we've seen, you know, there were different factions of criteria where we are now with IICL 6. You know, there was kind of a 10-year period. Not everybody was on board. There was amended criteria. And it took a long time. And I think the industry, as companies change to what they were doing with their fleets, has kind of spurned the, you know, less is more sometimes. Uh, resale has absolutely dictated a lot of change to the industry. Uh, you know, cargo worthy criteria is there's um, IICL criteria, you know, there's a food grade criteria, there's all these little niche things, but cargo worthy and resales uh, has kind of escalated the industry to, to not all just leasing. So I think leasing MR took a little bit of a hit with that because. We all needed to streamline at some point, um, and and it's and it's it's had a domino effect, right? Obviously, you in the depot business, we we talk about this. Is it's had effect on how leasing companies and how depots operate, and because yeah. of those changes, I think it's just had a direct link that is we kind of accept more of what we wouldn't normally have. It's it's taken down to what do you want to repair? How do we repair it? How do we view this? And what do we want to do with our equipment? And I think that it's the same philosophy in every every company, everywhere. It's just it is what it is, driven by the business right now. Absolutely, and that's that's like you you tied into this a few times. But I was gonna ask you how challenging is that that balancing act between the resale and the leasing? Because on the surface, you know, you guys are all still called a leasing company. That resale is such a monumental part of the overall revenue stream now, right? Where it, it, it wasn't historically, and it just keeps compounding itself internally, right? Yeah, I think what you're what you're seeing is, you know, you go back ten years or so, um, maybe fifteen resales is kind of a thing. We're selling boxes, leasing companies are having employees to where now. You know, the lines finally figured it out. Everybody's got a resale division. I mean, your your operation is 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 depots have turned into um, they've changed their business because of it, because the cost of containers, the depreciation of containers, and kind of the life cycle of containers has kind of been dictated that it's less than what it used to be. So as you kind of took that age limit down, you're you're seeing more resale, and you're right huge amount of business in all these companies is resale. And I'm I'm always shocked by it because I go, is there ever an end? Who I mean, how many containers are, are being bought? But when you see modifications, when you see these homes, I mean, uh, you know, in quarantine, I'm watching uh, container homes on Hulu or something I found. My wife's fascinated, okay? Sure. I don't want any more projects, okay? But it's really <laughs> cool to watch. Um, and what you can do with them, so... Now you have, you know, like you just alluded to Mark, the MPSA, you have trade shows now. Dictated for this stuff is, is just unbelievable where it's come in about 15 years. That, you know, twice a year, you guys are having these industry meetings. Um, and I have a, a, a rather large worldwide resale team. Um, and we'll reposition equipment. We'll do things. And all these resale people, end users, and how they're getting done. It's really a huge part of the business. It's It's... I actually think you probably will be developed even more as we go forward, as more people come in line. And the more modernized it gets, the more you guys and, and these places are doing with these containers, it just spurns more business uh, towards that part of the market. Yeah, and I and we you know we could probably go on a whole another episode about regulatory things and and 
criteria and how how the containers are now getting verified as these building elements and and that's just going to open up the next wave of utilization for resale right you know using them as a construction component in a building i mean that the the sky really is the limit on on where some of this goes but i do know i've had the same thought as you you know where does this end because i've i've woken up before and gone we're not going to sell a single box next month. We sold too many. There's th <laughs> we've saturated this whole thing, but it keeps going luckily. And, and here we are. Um, and to put this into just some general perspective for, for people watching and correct me on these numbers, but Techstainer has about three and a half million TEU overall in the fleet and sells about 150,000 TEU annually. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I would say that's pretty close. I don't have the number offhand, but you're, you're right. We're probably a little bit above 3.5 right now. And yeah, I would say that number of resales is, has been around that number, you know, 150, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less consistently for, for quite a few years now. Yeah, I just wanted to give some kind of scale if, if anybody's watching this and not really uh, able to comprehend some of that. That's, it's big numbers. How much uh, how much challenge do you see moving forward, or what what is the biggest challenge in your particular role within Techstainer? You know, right now, I think the challenge on the industry from an operation standpoint. This is something you know I talk about, and all of us guys who are on the kind of the op side, you know, see as we've come through the years, is that our base operation has changed a because of, of resale. And that spurred a change in, in our, our depot facilities. And I've seen that coming for a while. I know we've had this conversation for a couple of years now. Uh, during my sure. Day, is that the, the business isn't what it was. You know, you go back to the guys who taught me and taught you and your dad. By the way, tell your dad, I finally, I got the facial hair. <laughs> I'm in, the, I'm in the conversation now, all right? So I want, I want him to know. Right? <laughs> You're he will watch this, I promise you. He will watch this. <laughs> so so you, you have this, this, what do you use a depot for? It was 25 years ago, the guys we grew up with, you're writing a $3,000 estimate and every little dent and bump towards now is our criteria is, it's not broken. You know, it's, there's, not, there's no water. And just leave it. It's fine, you know? And, and so it's, it's developed less money for you guys, which has had forced you guys to change your kind of what you do. So here comes resales, here comes modification, here comes repurposing a land for other things. So from my perspective, that's a big concern. You know, listen, that's the way it is in the industry. So we have to look at what's, what's best for each other. The reality is you need the depots, you need the space, especially, especially in the major port locations. So as we go into the future, that's something that, you know, I think everybody looks at is you need to be stable and we need to make sure those depots are stable customers and can function that we can still work together. Some of those dynamics to our land costs in these port locations have really driven things kind of sideways. And I don't know if down the road, I would imagine at some point, there's going to be some kind of breaking point, especially in a... Oakland, LA, um, you know, Seattle kind of location that the land and the environmental issues uh, really discourage doing the business. And it's a shame because the worldwide economy runs on this. And I don't think people get that sometimes. So, you know, you want a TV for Christmas, guess what? It's coming in a container, right? <laughs> right. It's great. Well, you know, related related to that thought, and, and I, I agree with you, you know I agree with you on, on that becoming a potential challenge down the road, and we've, we've talked about it for several years, but um, probably 10 years ago, I had a senior VP from one of the leasing companies tell me, he sat there and just very matter-of-factly, he said, I think there'll be four depot cities in North America by 2025. And imagine hearing that 10 years ago, and, and thinking ahead and saying, there's no way that's even possible. Um, I will admit, I look at it today and I think it's a more feasible potential as, as we look forward. But who knows where that's gonna unfold and, and we've got a lot in store for both of us. But that, uh, that was an interesting take that I think suddenly I'm going, hmm, maybe, <laughs> maybe he was onto something. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think, 
as the industry kind of moves on, you know, one of the big problems from from the lines to the leasing companies, to even even depots, is we've seen consolidation, um, and that's part of the problem. Is is when does consolidation become so much that you're like, well, hey, it's great that you have this location, but we can't do anything there because there's one guy in town, everybody's in it, and that's that's some of the the operational problems we have now. Is is you, you know you and I know. Uh, we've gone through the last three years with quite a few closures of locations, guys who've gotten out of the business. Nobody's getting into the business. People be getting into the business <laughs> if they were making good money off the bat. And unfortunately, it is a tough dynamic right now. And, and with land costs and everything, it's a very um, kind of risky business right now, whereas in the past, it wouldn't have been such an issue. Sure. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Well, let's let's end on something more fun. If you okay. if you are out in a bar, what is your most favorite beer? So it's not something you've made. What is your absolute go to if we're out at a bar? Uh, you know what? I, I probably go with the IPAs. I, I'm pretty well rehearsed in, in what's out there and, and I'm I'm kind of a, a beer geek, so I'm well read on beer world. Um, so I would look for something of a northeast IPA easy IPA. That's okay. something I enjoy. It's got some oats in it, makes it soft, a little creamy. Enjoy the hops. Um, that that That's my go-to. Okay. Well, then when we're together, that's what we're doing, buddy. <laughs> Definitely. Hey, I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. And the uh, the idea of what a perfect fit you were for this show, you know, your, your expertise and your tie-in and everything. I just, I really do appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me on. You know, uh, if you ever want to talk about beer again, I got hours more of stuff for you. So uh, <laughs> don't, don't hesitate to call, man. You got it, brother. Thanks again. Hey, thanks, Kevin. Take care.